God. I'm glad y'all were able to make it this morning. I want to welcome you that might be watching on video this morning. I said that I was going to do a couple of messages out of Matthew. The first one was last week. That was message number one. This is message number two. I don't know how many there be. Maybe one more. Might do something in the parables next week. But uh, this particular, uh, this, is a, this is a message that Jesus spoke. And he, and as we will see as we read through, we're going to read the whole chapter of chapter 23. It says that he spoke specifically to the multitude and also to his disciples. So we're going to try to ascertain what the Lord wanted communicated through what he said this morning. Amen. So let's go ahead and, and we'll get started and we'll start reading right here. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying to the scribes and the Pharisees, sit in uh, Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe that, and observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So basically he was saying to the multitude and to his disciples, those scribes and Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat, I want you to do what they're telling you, but don't do things the way that they do it, because they don't really do what they're supposed to. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Just real quick, I mean, what he's saying is, listen, you don't need to be seeking a title. You don't need to, oh, my name's Pastor Matt, I'm Bishop Abair, I'm the Apostle, call, you know, no, no, just, you don't need a title. You know, just, just be a real person. Don't, you don't have to clothe yourself in religion and, think, and, and be looking to be elevated, right? But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself, shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Basically he's saying, you bunch of scribes and Pharisees, you bunch of religious hypocrites, you're, you're, you're actually closing the door and preventing people from being able to enter into the kingdom of God. You're not going in. You're not even going in. You're not even walking into the right direction. And not only that, your religion and the spirit behind what you're doing is actually preventing people from being able to move towards the kingdom of God. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense or a show, you make long prayers. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass, or you cross sea and land, to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Real quick, you know. You may not have ever even heard people use this particular word, proselyte. If you've been in like a non-denominational church all of your life, I learned this when I first went to the Assembly of God Church. I was sitting at a table with a bunch of people that had been involved in the Assemblies of God. And they, one, one of the leaders used this word, well, you've been proselytizing. And so the way that they use that word in the modern church in these denominations is, is that basically it'd be kind of like, if, if you were a preacher and you were trying to go get someone else 
from somebody else's church to try to come to your church. And so, so they really frowned on that. As a matter of fact, they even heard that there was a, a at one time in this community that the churches in this community got together and all the pastors were like, well, hey, brother, I'll tell you what, if, if, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. And if someone from your church tries to come to my church, then I'll tell them, oh, no, 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 you're not welcome. Well, you need to go ahead and submit to your pastor. Well, hold on a sec. Hold on a second. No, because the truth of the matter is that the people are God's people. They're the sheep of the Lord, the great shepherd who laid down his life. I'm not going to go actively knocking on somebody else's door to try to get their people to come to another church. I can tell you that. But I will say this, is that if the people are hungry and they're looking for something, if anybody's welcome to come to the, the, the walls of the church to hear the word of the Lord. And then they can choose for themselves what it is that they want to hear. And so I got to tell you, so basically what these religious leaders were doing, what Jesus was saying is, is that they were actually causing people to convert to their form of Judaism. But that the reality of it is, is that they weren't even, they, even though they were getting them to convert to their ways of religion, they weren't really leading them towards God to begin right, with, right. right? He said, you make him more, too, you, he said, you make proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold or twice more the child of hell than yourself. Yeah, don't you just love it whenever you find Jesus in a little spot right here, and he looks completely different than what people make him out to be? I mean, Jesus is really giving it to these guys, right? He says, Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind, for whatever is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. You know, one of the things that you need to understand, too, in the, in the face of when Jesus shows up, you know, real quick, let me just say this. When we studied the, the book of Daniel, y'all re will remember when we studied the book of Daniel. Daniel prophesied about, uh, well, Daniel was alive whenever the Babylonian kingdom took the children of Israel and the children of Judah of the southern kingdom captive. And then he had prophesied about Persia. You remember that? And he was alive whenever Persia took over. He prophesied about the Grecian Empire. And then he also prophesied about Rome. And there was about a 400-year period Right where all of these things were taking place when there were no prophets of Israel speaking. Okay, well that was during that time frame whenever these Pharisees and these scribes came into being. And what I need you to understand is that was the religious atmosphere whenever Jesus was born into the Roman Empire. That these religious leaders had created their own little laws. And when you can read other commentaries and other information, and, and the idea is, is that they had created about 600 of their own laws that they added to the law of Moses. So they created their own little laws. And th things like this. Oh, no, you can't swear by the temple, but you can swear by the gold that is in the temple. So, so somebody might swear by the temple. I mean, that, that was a big thing. Moses said, you know, something about that. But, but no, we say, but, but if you swear by the gold of the temple, it's one little thing to always try to make themselves look better, more holy, more right. Have you ever been around anybody like that? That's what I'm really trying to trying to get at. If you haven't met anybody like that before, sooner or later you're going to come across people like that. And I, I'm not going to try to encourage you that, that as you grow in your walk with God, you don't want to be that person. Mom. Amen. <laughs> You don't want to be bound up by a spirit of religion and thinking that everything that you do is right and everything that you do is more holy and that everything everybody else does as they're trying to walk for the Lord is not any good. No. The truth of the matter is, is that, Jesus, if you are a believer this morning, you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Amen? You've been bought with a price. Yes. And you are now a child of God. Hallelujah. And, and, you know, what we should be doing is encouraging others to continue to walk. But that's basically the atmosphere of what Jesus comes into. It's just a big, it's a, it's a pop, very burdensome spirit of religion. Almost like the idea that nobody can ever do anything right. He says, but, but nothing, but whosoever swears by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind. For whether it's greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. 
Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, swears by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, swears by it, and by him that dwells therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, swears by the throne of God, and by him that sits thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, like judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. You know, I just want to make a point. So I have a, a little message within this reading, right? But I didn't, I wasn't able to cover everything. This is a very long chapter. But just, just take note of this right here. He's trying to make a point. See, he's talking to this religious sect. You, you got to understand something. The more you study the Bible, the more you study the surrounding information, the more you get to see a little bit of a better picture of what's taking place, right? And then you can kind of take that information and you can place it into your own life. I want you to, again, imagine Jesus born into a world where the religious leaders of the nation from which he came, which God had called, right? We've already learned that. That God created a nation out of a man named Abraham. And the reason that God did that was because he wants to save the world. <laughs> he wants light in the midst of darkness. Listen, this story is either real or it's not. And if it's real, then what we learn as we read God's word is that he's had a plan from the beginning. Even from before the fall of the first man, Adam, God already knew that he had a plan of redemption and how he was going to save mankind to create an eternal family that would be able to dwell with him. But along the way, there's always been a spirit on the earth that has been tempting mankind to try to drive him in a direction that is opposite of God. Specifically, even in the garden, whenever Satan tries to twist the word of the Lord, surely in the day that you eat, you shall not die, but instead you shall know and you be, shall become as gods. This lying spirit that just barely tries to tweak the word of God and it disguise itself in a way that people can't tell maybe the difference between a lie and the truth. And so this same spirit has been on the earth all of this time in competition, if I could say it that way, or disguising itself to cause confusion. We can call it a lot of different things, but it all comes from Satan. We can call it the spirit. I know that I've done this many times, but let's do it again. The spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of Babel, man helping man outside of God. The spirit, the, 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 the spirit of self-righteousness, the spirit of religion. It's all coming from the enemy of God. You understand that? Through demonic spirits, fallen angels, 
It's, it's all coming from the enemy of God, and it's all for the purpose of bringing deception to mankind, so that he won't go the right way. He'll go in an opposite direction, you see. See, for you and I, we're like, well, I'll never serve Allah, I'll never serve Buddha, I'll never serve Krishna. You know, those are easy, but what about a spirit of religion within the constant church? What about a spirit of religion, a hypocritical religion, a blind pharisaical religion that sends people in the wrong direction within the Protestant church that you and I have been sitting in for all of our lives? Yeah. See, that spirit is against and wants to murder the true spirit of God. That spirit of religion, that spirit of deception wants to bring death to the truth. See, that's what Jesus was saying right here. I said all that because I wanted you to see this. He's telling the spirit, these, these religious people, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Look at that. You know who Abel is, right? Mm -hmm. Abel is the first martyr in the Bible. Who is Abel? Abel was Cain's brother. Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel. Now listen, you don't have to go back. I didn't even plan on talking about all this, but I want you to know. You don't have to go back to the story to even see what really happened there. And if we take that information that happened there, and then we move forward and understand what God taught his people Israel, we realize that Cain did not like the fact that God received and accepted the offering of his brother Abel. Well, what kind of offering did Abel bring? Abel brought the slain of an animal. Abel brought a sacrifice that required the letting of blood, that required the life of the animal, because he was a herder of sheep, but his brother Cain was a tiller of the land. His brother Cain was a farmer, and Cain, it's not that he didn't bring anything. He brought the best of what he could offer unto God, the fruit of the land, the work of his own hand. But you see, Adam had learned the hard way after the fall because the Bible says they tried to cover themselves in fig leaves. But God said, no, that's not going to work. And God performed the first sacrifice. He killed an innocent animal that had nothing to do with the sin of Adam and Eve. And he clothed Adam and Eve with that, that skin of that innocent, righteous animal, which was a type of Jesus to come, who would be the eternal Lamb of God, who would die on the cross, shed His blood so that you could be forgiven, so that you, so that I could be forgiven. And Adam would have explained that to his boys. And so now it comes time to worship, and they know what they're supposed to do. And Abel brings the firstling of the flock. He brings an animal sacrifice, a type of Jesus, a type of the only way that you will ever be able to get to God or that you will ever be able to continue to walk in faith with God. Why? Because you got to understand what makes you righteous in the eyes of God. It's not your works, my friend. It's not all your religious work and all of the things that you do that you are so proud of that you do right and nobody else does wrong. No, 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 no. There was only one that did it right. His name was Jesus. Amen. He's the son of the only begotten son of the Father. Yes. This is my son. In him I am well pleased the voice from heaven spoke. And when you and I can surrender and submit ourselves to the eternal plan of God, guess what? We become pleasing to God yes. of the Father because we've accepted the plan that he gave. And he didn't like that. You see, because the Lord was upset with Cain's offer. You see, but he brought something. I don't understand. He put on his best Sunday clothes. He, he, he was at church early. He was involved in multiple ministries. He was doing all of these things. It was all the wrong motive, all the wrong heart. The things that they do, they do to be seen of men. It's a completely different spirit that's behind the whole thing. And I'm here to tell you, my friend, it's alive and well in the modern church. Amen. Yes. And it killed Abel. Cain just killed him and buried him somewhere in the ground thinking that God couldn't see. Mm. He's like, where's your brother? It says later on, he says, your, the, blood of your, the blood of Abel cries out. The righteous blood of Abel cries out from the ground. 
There's only one right way to access God. There's a right spirit behind it. Listen to me. The spirit of religion wants to kill it. The spirit of religion does not want people to be able to come to the truth. Yes. And i got to tell you that even in this modern church that you and I are living in this time frame, that the truth of the gospel is not well accepted. I believe that. So from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often would have I gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so, you know, the Lord is about to go to the cross, and he's having these conversations. And, you know, we studied Matthew 24 Wednesday night about the end times. And Jesus is preparing those that will listen to him and those that will receive his instruction before he's about to go to the cross. And, and, and he's explaining to them what the kingdom of God is. Is supposed to look like, and he's allowing all people to know that you know there's another spirit that's involved, and it's the spirit of religion, and it stands in the way. I want to just kind of like point out a few different things here. This is my the first the first, the title of my message is really would be spiritually blind. So that's really the main concept and the main idea of what I see the Lord focused on. How many times did he call them blind guys? How many times did he did he call them hypocrites? One of the things that has stood out to me about the gospel is, is this scripture that Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. He talked about, he said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. He went on to say this, he said, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So what we see in this passage of scripture is that Paul is letting us know that the gospel that he preached. Now, the thing about the Apostle Paul, if you don't know this, is he gives us in-depth understanding and revelation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And you understand that. Whenever we, whenever we talk about the cross and we talk about the spiritual aspect of it and what it means about faith in Christ and Him crucified daily, what that means is, is that as I keep my faith in the fact that Jesus has already done, does that make sense? Jesus has already accomplished the work that needed to be accomplished to make you and I righteous before God. And when we believe that, guess what happens? God releases grace into our life. God releases power into our life. And supernaturally, he gives us the power that we need to walk in victory. To walk in victory today. So that we can be witnesses for him. But see, the, the, the God of this world, which is Satan, wants to blind the eyes of this world. And as the church has invited the world in, you, you, you've heard me say this before, but let, let me say it again. This whole seeker-sensitive movement, you may not even be familiar with it, but the mega church movement, seeker-sensitive movement, that everything looks cool, everything looks relevant, it looks, the church looks more like a club than it does a church. All this stuff was methodical. I'm here to tell you, it's documented, that churches on the West Coast they went to the world around them, the neighbors around them. They literally knocked on doors and they asked them what they could do in their services to make the services more appealing to the world out there. So basically what I'm trying to tell and so they changed things according to the things that they learned. They wrote it down, you know, and, and they made changes to the way church was done based on that. And so what, what I'm trying to tell you, what is my point? My point is, is that they opened up the doors and they said, come on in, world. The church always welcomed the world to come in to hear the truth of the gospel so that the world would hear and understand that born of Adam, you're born in sin and you're separated from the presence of God. But that God has a beautiful plan that he would send his son Jesus to pay the penalty for sin and that if you would be willing to believe that, then you would be acceptable to God. 
but not just to, to, you know, to produce some type of an environment where the world feels, feels comfortable. And so, but basically that's what the, the church has done. They've invited the world in. And so now the God of this world has been invited into this thing that we call the mega church, the secret citizen. But the God of this world blinds the minds of them so that they cannot believe. Because, because he's trying to prevent this glorious gospel from shining the light and allowing it to see. I hope that makes sense to you this morning. That the spirit of the world, everything you're going to watch on television, everything you're going to listen to on the radio, everything that your friends at school are going to tell you, and most of the people that you work with is going to be in opposition to the truth of the gospel. Listen to me, some, some of the people that you work with that love God, guess what? They're still being influenced by the spirit of this. That's why Jesus said, do what they say, because if they're telling you the truth, but don't do it the way that they're doing it. Matter of fact, let's just take that for a moment. Just because some dude at work, some girl at work, the boss, whoever, says one thing but acts a different way, does not discount the fact that Jesus does it right. Doesn't discount the fact that the Lord is right. No, the God of this world is trying to blind the eyes of people Amen. so that they can't properly see the gospel. Look, this is, this is, and, and, and you know, these Pharisees, this is a picture of a Pharisee out of a movie. This is a, a depiction, Mel Gibson's depiction of what Pharisees would have looked like in there. Uh, see how religious they are. You see how, how pretty their clothing is. Jesus is constantly dealing with these guys, these Pharisees. Okay? He's constantly dealing with it. You know, as a matter of fact, I didn't plan on doing this, and I don't even know if it'll work that great, but I don't know if you can even see this, but listen, this is just a little teaching point. Sanhedrin. You see that word, Sanhedrin? Can you read that? You might make it read it back there. I don't know. Can you see it? Sanhedrin? You know what the Sanhedrin was? It was a group of two different sets of people. They had the Sadducees, and they had the Pharisees. Okay. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. That was a song that they used to sing in Sunday school. I'm sad to be a, I'm sad to be a Sadducee. And the reason why I don't even know what the words were, but something about the Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So you can see in the Gospels that the Sadducees came to Jesus. They didn't believe in the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees were two religious groups that formed one main religious group known as the Sanhedrin. And they were basically kind of like the law of Israel. They were religious leaders. That's what made Israel different. They were kind of like the government or ruling body of Israel. The reason I'm trying to tell you that is because I gave you like a little calendar for you to read the Bible. I need you to notice something as you're reading through these Gospels that Jesus is constantly coming into contact with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He's constantly having uh, things that are going on that he's constantly having to deal with these Sadducees and these Pharisees, right? And, and, I want you to, and, 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 and I want you to notice that this same spirit rests on leaders in churches today. They want to sit in Moses' seat. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be called rabbi, rabbi. They want to be exalted and everybody else will be lowered. Listen, they're not going to go around telling you that, but you can sense it. I hope that you can understand what it is that I'm trying to explain to you. So the Pharisees were full of religion. They were full of pride. That was one of the main things that, that you, and, and listen, we're going to move forward and we'll get to it in a moment, but God's not okay with pride. And let me tell you why God's not okay with pride. Satan, the first sin was pride. Satan, it says about Satan that, that he was, in the day that he was created, he was made perfect in all of his ways until pride entered into his heart. These Pharisees, we learned from Jesus, were hypocrites, and ultimately, because of how they were, they were spiritually born. So, in going, this is one of the scriptures that has always kind of stuck out to me that Jesus said. See, he spoke to the Pharisees, and, and when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans, that's a tax collector. So, I know I've tried to explain this to you before, but there was no person in Israel that was looked more lowly than a tax collector. Okay, Matthew was a tax collector, right? Why were they looked so lowly? Because they were their own people, and they were commissioned by Caesar to tax the people, 
to get Caesar his money, but they had they had the, the power to take more and to extort their own people so that they could put more money in their own pocket. And so they were hated by the people. It was bad enough that they had to pay taxes to Caesar, but their, but their own people were extorting them. And so they just looked at them as the lowest of the low. So Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, and they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, this is what he said to them. They that are whole, whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, I really love this because you got to read between the lines of what's really going on here. Right, right. If you read between the lines of what's really going on here, Jesus is saying, I know, man, you're well. You're righteous. You, you didn't need me. You didn't need me to come. I came for those that are sick. It's the sick people that need you see, Jesus came for those that are willing to see and to understand that they needed him. Yeah, right. Jesus came for those that are willing to be humble enough to realize that all that separate from him, I'm altogether undone and that I'm not okay. But as long as I can think in my heart and my mind, I'm not all that bad. I've never killed anybody. I've never cheated. I've never done this. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't do, go through the whole plethora of things. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. No, no, no. That's a self-righteous religious spirit that cannot see that it's sick and that it needed Jesus to be here. That's really what he's telling these people. He's not straight up telling them right here, but he's kind of saying it in a veiled way. Going back to where we're reading today. He says, all, all therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe that, observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. I already made mention of this, but I want to say, sometimes you're going to run into Christians in your life, people that profess Christianity, Guess what? We're all going to run into people in our lives. You're going to run into me one day whenever I'm going to do something that does not reflect the Lord. But I will tell you this much. By the grace of God, as long as God's spirit is moving in my heart and in my life, if I do something wrong and the Lord convicts me of it, I'm going to let you know that I feel like I did it wrong. And I'm going to come to you and I'm going to apologize. Not, listen, yes, I'm humble enough to say I want you to be okay with me. Does that make sense? Like, I care about what you think about me. But it's even bigger than that. You need to understand that. It's bigger than that. It's because it's a reflection on the Jesus that I serve. As a matter of fact, this is kind of like an interesting story. I was the other day in, uh, in, in the hospital, and somebody brought up the fact that I was a pastor. And, and this, one of the nurses said, she might be watching this morning because I told her, you know, how to get on but she said, yeah, it's the first preacher I ever met that, that cusses. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and, you know, it was like a big deal. Like, I had to stop the whole thing. I'm like, cusses? Yeah, you said that. And I said, no, ma'am. I said, now, first of all, hold on a second. Let's just be careful here. Because it's not like it's impossible that a bad word could never come out of my mouth. But I can tell you this. I don't cuss. And had I cussed, I would have been very aware of it. And I would have fix the situation right then and there. So whatever you thought you heard, I can assure you, you did not hear a cuss word come out of my mouth. Again, it's not impossible that the preacher could never say a bad word. It's not impossible that the preacher could never do anything wrong. But for that particular area of my life, if the wrong kind of word came out of my mouth, it would be so magnified and so caused so much turmoil in my heart that I would have to deal with it Right then and there, and, and let me tell you, let me tell you why you know. And, and, and ultimately, I ended up saying this. I said, and the, and the reason why I know I didn't cut, and that you misunderstood what you thought came out of my mouth, is because that had been a poor reflection on my Jesus. Right. And it would have it would have affected me in my spirit that I had to. Now, now I'm not trying to say that there's not other things in my life that aren't affecting me or aren't convicting me that I'm not doing right and that I need the Lord to convict me of it. But I can tell you right now, had I done that, and, and I didn't, and so we didn't move on because, you know, the, the ER director wants to know the name of the church. We're like, hold on a second. No, we're going we're gonna to deal with this right here before we move on with the next thing because, see, we can't be having Jesus' name looking back. Amen. Amen. That's really the reason of what needs to be done right here. 
not because Matt needs to be seen as holier than thou or whatever. No, no, no. But it's because his life is a reflection on his master, which is Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 It does not mean that I can't go wrong because I can't, because I'm a human being. But right. Lord, right. help me to know when I'm going wrong. Help me to acknowledge it and help me yes. to let others know, hey, listen, and humble myself enough yeah. to be able to go to others and say, hey, listen, I missed it right there. Right. Yeah. I, I missed it right there. Because I've been vocal about, about serving God, I want you to know I, the Lord's convicted me. And listen, if you will be willing to learn how to live your life that way, I'm telling you right now, you will find great power. Great power, great peace, a great move of the Holy Spirit in your life. He says, whatsoever they did to you, observe it, that observe and do, but don't do it after them. So again, you're going to run into Christians, you'll run into even me, unfortunately, at times. And that's a big difference, though. It's a big difference whenever you run into a Christian who has done something wrong, and they realize it, and they acknowledge it, and they, and they, and they ask the Lord to do something in their heart versus a person who's sitting there constantly living under a spirit of religion, Constantly thinks that they're holier than now and they're doing all kind of stuff that is a poor reflection on the Lord. That's a big difference. Amen? Mm -hmm. Observe. Be watchful. Care. Hold on to something and to do it. So, listen. All of God's word is very important. Amen? Even the law. You cannot live for God by trying to keep the laws and the commandments. Because you're going to fall short. But guess right. what? Right. God's laws and commandments give you great revelation to understand what God loves and what God hates. Amen. It gives you a, a, a picture into the window of God's heart to allow you to know what he's okay with and what he's not okay with. Amen? And so all of God's word is to be observed and, and to be cared about in our lives. Amen? Amen? He goes on to say, but all their works they do for to be seen of men... They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Okay, we're going to get into that a little bit. What is a phylactery? What, is it, what does this mean? We're going to look at it for a moment. But what I want you to see is, the other, do you see, can you see the spirit behind it? That religious people want to be acknowledged. Or even sometimes they're not always just religious people. Sometimes there's just a spirit of religion on it. That's why the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is. See, a lot of times we all, and there's times that, there's many times that we all want to be acknowledged. Amen. Yeah? Amen. Hey, Pastor Matt, did you see, I mean, or, you know, Pastor whoever, did you see how shiny the floor is in the bathroom? Or did you see how clean the carpet was over there? Did you see, or, you know, no, don't pick on the person cleaning the church. Or, hey, hey, Pastor, did you see, notice this right here? Hey, did you hear what I did for this person over there? Listen. If you're just sharing a testimony with somebody, there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got to check your own heart and make sure that you're not looking to be exalted and to be Amen. acknowledged. Can you really do something for the Lord and be happy with the fact that you know you are obedient to God Amen. and that he may be the only one that saw you do it? For great will your reward be in heaven. But all their works they do for to be seen by men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Let's take a look at this a little bit. What is a phylactery? Okay. It might be hard to kind of see this right here, but there's this little thing right here around this guy's around this guy's head. You see that? And he's also got something probably tied somewhere around his arm right here. And so this is what a phylactery was. It was like a little box that was tied. Uh, to their arms or to their heads. And look, this is the scripture where they get it from out of Deuteronomy. You shall bind them, talking about the word of the Lord, the commandments of God. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So during Jesus' time frame, these Pharisees would put scriptures in these boxes and they'd tie it to their head. And they even got to the point where they would call them the bleeding Pharisees because they, they would their boxes, their boxes would get broader and broader. That's what Jesus was saying. You made broader phylacteries to the point where they couldn't even see. And they were running into walls and they had blood coming down their face because they were getting so holy. They wanted everybody to see how holy they were. Look at that big old phylactery box. They're going to put your scripture stuffed up in there. It's a spirit of religion, man. It blinds people and they don't even see. I know it seems ridiculous as a point. And sometimes you will see people while they may not be walking around with a big old box on their head. 
It's ridiculous on how they're looking at the religion that they did. Because it's not really of the Lord. Amen? So, phylacteries, brought in garments, right? An outward show of religion that's only purpose is to try to impress men and to make men, it's a spirit that's behind it, to make some people are like, oh, look how holy, look how holy that man, no, 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 there was only one that was holy. His name was Jesus. Oh, and anybody that tries to tell you something else is telling you a lie. Oh, no, he was the only one, amen? amen? But he that is greatest, see, that's what Jesus says, no, if you want to be great in my kingdom, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So in the kingdom of God, God wants you to know, I know we've been talking about this a lot lately, God done flipped the script. He done flipped it over upon itself. See, it, you know what's even interesting? If you go into, the, into the, one of the Gospels where it talks about the sons of Zebedee. You remember the sons of Zebedee was John and his brother, Andrew, I believe it was. John and Andrew, maybe I'm getting the, the brother wrong. But, but nevertheless, it was the sons of Zebedee, and they were also known as the sons of thunder. And what ended up happening is, is, that, is that their mother came with them to Jesus. And what they said was, who's going to be able to sit on your right side in your kingdom? Now, Jesus had just told them that he was about to go to Jerusalem. And then he was about to die on the cross. They don't even listen to what he just said. What they want to know is, can I sit on your right side when you come into your kingdom? They're so focused on themselves. They're so focused on some type of a position. And Jesus is letting people know that, look, if you're going to exalt your own self, guess what? You're going to be a base. What does that mean? You're going to be made to love. <laughs> so listen to me, child of God, whoever might be listening. If you're filled with the spirit of pride, and you're all over here trying to elevate and to exalt yourself according to the world standards. I got to tell you something. If you truly do love God, God will find, have a way for you to be lowly. Mm -hmm. Amen. But he goes on to say this, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Amen. It's an important thing for us to realize that by the grace of God, we need to ask the Lord that we would be able to be humble. I wanted you to, to, see, to see this right here. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint <clears throat> and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith, and not to leave the others undone. So you see the, the little picture right here. This, is, this, is, this would be mint, the leafy stuff, uh, anise and cumin. These are herbs. Now I want you to try to get the picture here. I probably should have put a scale up here, like an old hand scale. Because basically what you know the tithe is, right? Most of you by now probably know what the tithe is. The first tithe was paid by Abraham to a king named Melchizedek. A tithe means a tenth. So it's very biblical for you to give a tenth of your money to the kingdom of God. Now I'm going to make that clear. You're giving it to the kingdom of God. If you don't feel like you're in a church where you would be giving your money to the kingdom of God, then you need to find another church. Okay, and what you're doing is, is that you're giving your, see, if you read it through throughout the whole of the word of God, what you're realizing is this, is that, and you may not like this, but I'm just here to tell you what I have learned in the word of God, the whole 100% ain't yours to begin with. The whole 100% of everything that you have actually belongs to the Lord. The, the, the truth of the, the be told is that the very air <clears throat> within your lungs is a gift given to you by God. Amen. See, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we really see our relationship with the Lord that way? Is he really master of our life? Is he really king of our heart? Okay, because, because that's what the word of the Lord would say that a servant truly is. He's one that submits to the lordship of his king. Amen. And so, but what God has required of his people through the scriptures, and we will do another teaching on it before it's over to make the point, is a tenth. He's asking his people to give a tenth of their increase to the kingdom of God. Not to the preacher, right? but to the work of God. And we can, we can work through that from Abraham giving his tithe way before there ever was a nation called Israel into the book of Leviticus, and, and we can work through that, and we can see it to be very clear that this is what God... Now, people would maybe say, 
Well, if I give a tip, I won't be able to pay my bills. Now, you 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 know where you are. You know where you live. And you know what your situation is. And everybody goes through various seasons. Amen? Seasons in their life financially. <coughs> various things like that. But listen to me. I, want, I didn't plan on talking a whole lot about tithing. I really didn't, but I'm trying to explain what a tithe is. All right? What I, what I need you to understand is this. Do you believe, or even if you haven't experienced, do you believe that what Jesus did when he died on the cross was enough to give you access to grace today for victory on the earth? Yes. I always want to ask that. Amen? Mm -hmm. like in other words, when Jesus said, it is finished, and Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says that he, that he uh, triumphed over principalities and powers, meaning he took the victory over the forces of evil. Do you believe that Jesus won the victory over evil when he died on the cross, and that if you will continue to believe that, that you have access to grace that can empower you and give you victory on earth today? I hope you do. So the next question that I'm trying to make is, do you believe that if you will release a tenth of what God has allowed you to have, that he can bless the rest and give you more than what it is that you need? Do, I don't know. Do you believe that? Yeah. Well, preacher, I tried and it don't work. Well, hold on a second. Let's just, let's just stop for one quick second and let's ask a couple of other questions. Number one, were you faithful in that? Number two. Did you also do what the proverb told you not to do? What are you talking about? The slugger turns over on his bed and he says, there's a lion in the streets. What are you talking about? There's no lion in the street, dude. Get up, put your work boots on, and go to work. See, because you can't pay a tithe and then refuse to go to work to get up and to do your responsibility and expect that you will be blessed. The Word of God also says that he that does not work is worse than an infidel. <laughs> Did you also take the money that you had and give it to usury? What does that mean? Well, you live according to the credit market. You borrowed so much money that now you have interest payments that are 23%. That's 13% that's is points higher than what the Lord asked for you to pay him. You're paying the Rockefellers the tithe that belongs to the Lord. Amen. You're paying the banking industry the money that belongs to the Lord. The Lord never told you to get indebted to the credit marketers. The way that, that, the way, and listen, I, well, you know, I don't like what, what that preacher's preaching. You know why I'm preaching so hard? Because I have been indebted to the credit markets, market. Amen. Amen. I talk about it all day long if I want to. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point. Do we believe that if we would pay a tithe that the Lord would bless? Yes, yes, yes. Lord. Not because we're doing some spiritual lottery like the word of faith teacher preaches. Amen. No. Amen. <laughs> that ain't what we're preaching here, my friend. Well, if you sow your thousand dollar seed, you're going to get a twenty thousand re reward. No, 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 no. Because you know what, I might not get a twenty thousand. All right. As a matter of fact, I might not get this reap this financial blessing tomorrow, right. even a year from now, even two years. I might not ever even. I will. I guarantee you one day. He has never seen his seed begging bread. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Lord knows the cow on a thousand hills. He has painted his streets in gold. And I guarantee you, you will not go without. Amen. I had a, that sister was sharing with me the other day. Everything that I needed and more was given to me at the worst times of my life. The Lord will make sure that those that are his are taken care of. I can assure you yes. of that. You may be blessed in abundance. Why? So that you can give. For the kingdom of God, so that you can give unto others, and that's how you can bless others. And guess what, though? You might just not only get your needs met, but you might also get a reap of spiritual blessing. The question is, can you believe? Can you believe that God is big enough? Can you trust Him in that area? Oh, but man, I work hard for that. I know you do. But can you trust Him in that area? That's between you and the Lord. I guarantee you, I'm not back there like, oh, how much did they give this? Nah, look, that's between. That's between each person and the Lord. Amen. But the question is, can you believe? And don't be blaming it on the Lord. I can't pay that whenever you do. But you sure not paying the Rockefellers. I know that said it once, <laughs> but I'm going to say it again. Don't blame it on the Lord if you got yourself in a situation and it's not God's fault. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. Praise God. I have believed by the grace of God that he could do more. He could do abundantly, exceedingly, above all that I could ever Amen. think or imagine. Amen. By his grace now, I didn't always start off that way. Because right. I guarantee you, I had a bad attitude when I first started putting money in, <laughs> in, the, in the basket. All right? But I have seen him. So, so can you imagine these Pharisees, though, they're paying tithe. Look, they're paying tithe on, these, on mint. I wish I had a hand scale because I'd show you. Can you imagine them? Can, they're trying to figure out what a tenth is of that anise, that green stuff, and that bowl right there. Let me get a tenth of that. I'm going to get that tenth. I'm going to get that back to the temple. But they're doing all this out in public. Like, look at how much I'm giving to the kingdom of God. Look what I do. You know, I'm paying so close attention. You know, this goes back to also, he said, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel whole. What's he, what's he talking about? He, he said a gnat that would drop into a glass of water would make it unclean. And they're over there like, oh, get that gnat out of there. And when everybody see how holy and righteous and pure they are, get the gnat out of there, but you're going to eat a camel, big old nasty, unclean animal camel, and you're just going to swallow that thing whole. Basically, what he's saying is, is that you're over here nitpicking and trying to act like you all holy, but look at this thing in your life right here that you're not even getting right with me. He said you should have paid attention to the way your matters, like judgment and mercy. You know, ju judgment is justice, injustice, right or wrong. When you and I learn the word of the Lord, do you know what we, when we start, that's why I wanted y'all to try to read the Bible through. Mm -hmm. Because when you start to get an overall understanding of the Bible, you know what happens is I'm telling you, the word of God starts to renew your thinking. Yes. It starts to change the way you think. Yes. I wouldn't call it brainwashing, but I call it washing your brain. <laughs> when you start to wash your brain with the word of the Lord, it starts to change your mindset. That's it right. starts to change the way you do. The world that you live in. And you start to be able to see right and wrong. Amen. And then the Lord will show you how to handle situations. That's right and that's wrong. Yes. Mercy. Listen. Kindness. Goodwill towards others. And most of the time towards people that don't deserve, deserve it. If you would be willing to allow God to humble your heart. And you would be kind and merciful towards people that have done you wrong. Guess what? God wants to be mind, kind and merciful towards you. Amen. Faith to believe God. Amen. You know, there were weightier matters of the law that the, that the religious were. He said, no, that's good. Give your tithe of your cumin and your anise and your mint. But guess what? Pay attention to the weightier matters of what the Word of God says also. Amen. Amen. <laughs> these are these are whitewashed tombs. That's what these are right here. Whitewashed tombs. Okay, see how they look nice and clean on the outside? But, you know, the Word of God teaches in the book of Numbers that if they would touch the, a dead person or if they would come in close proximity of a dead person, that it made them unclean for seven days. So Jesus says this. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like a whited sepulcher. You're like a whitewashed tomb, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Now, you've got to understand something. Jesus isn't talking to people that have things that are going on in their life that they're not okay with. Do, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? All of us in this room have things in our life that God's dealing with us about. Does that make sense? Yes. Praise God. Amen. I mean, because listen, we're fallen creatures. But, but who Jesus is talking to is the one that thinks they look like a whitewashed tomb. They, they're like all nice and clean and they present themselves that way outwardly, but yet they know that there's something that's not right inwardly, and they're acting holier than thou. They're judging other people, and they're unwilling to see the faults that are in their own heart. That's what the Lord's talking about. A couple of other things that I know through this passage of Scripture, we're about to close it up, but a couple of things that I know that Jesus, in opposition to what he was talking to these people, he, God resists the proud. You know that? Amen. This scripture right here, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 7. He says, likewise, the younger should submit yourselves to the elder. Yes, look at this. All of you should be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. That means that no matter what your rank or station is in life, that as a brother or sister in the Lord, you should be willing to humble yourself to another person. That means that even, okay, even as the pastor of a church, okay, if I'm preaching or teaching something, 
And I realized, listen, I don't get this right all the time, but I'm being honest with you. I know that this is the Lord's will. That if I'm preaching or teaching something that you may not completely understand or agree with or whatever the case, that I still need to handle myself with humility. Like, I don't, like, if you and I are in a one on one particular situation and there's some type of a conversation, and I might not even agree with you, right? But, that, but I still need to be humble and to see you and I that we're on the same plane here. Amen. The cross makes everybody level. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. I hope that makes sense. That makes sense in the real world, too. In the secular world. Somebody might be a boss, and yes, as a good employee, you should always be mindful and respectful of your boss, but that doesn't mean that the boss that is a believer also should not humble himself and be willing to see the error of his ways or where he might have gone or she might have gone wrong and be able to humble themselves because guess what? People that can follow and get behind a leader like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that that's the, now, in the world where you see that, you ever heard Donald Trump say he's sorry? I don't think you ever will. Maybe. Maybe should the, should the Lord tear. I'm just trying to make a point. That man right there ain't handled his business like a believer. Not through the years. No, he has handled it. I'm not coming against him. I'm glad that he got gold leaf on his walls. Good for him. The American way. Capitalism. Make your money. Okay. And I'm not even opposed to when you're the boss, being the boss. I'm not opposed to that. But at the same time, as a believer... That should be tempered with some humility. <laughs> because if Jesus is living on the inside of your heart, there should be some humility in there. Amen? The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. You see there, there's Jesus. Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister and what? To let, give his life as a ransom for men. See there, the, the message of the cross will teach you and I humility. When it works in real life, the message of the cross will humble you and I, humble you and I one towards another. Amen? I'm about to close with this. Naya, y'all can come forward, the singers, musicians. But look at Jeremiah 31, 31. This is an Old Testament passage. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Look at this. I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. You see, in the new covenant, what has happened is that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Does that make sense? When you got saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. The Holy Spirit is the one that wrote the law. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that wrote the law. Amen? If we could say the finger of God was the Spirit of God writing the law for man. And now that you're saved, the very author of the law lives on the inside of your heart. The main point that I'm trying to get across is that, look, what God wants us to see that the spiritually blind can't see is this, that God wants to work right here. He wants to work on the inside of our hearts. He wants... He wants the inside of the cup clean. He doesn't want just the outside of the cup clean. He wants the inside of the cup clean. He doesn't want just the tombs to be lighted, washed white. No, 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 the out exterior. No, he wants the inside to be dead. See, that's what the message of the cross will really do if you allow it to work in your heart and your life. What are you talking about? When you put your faith in Christ and you understand that he is your only hope, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal things to your heart and to your life. And guess what? All you got to do is bring that. Simple prayer that says, Lord, I believe you died to set me free from this thing that you're showing me that's in my heart. I pray that you would apply the cross to this. I pray that you would put resurrection life and power in this. This last little scripture right here. See this? Paul said this. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter. 
whose praise is not of men but of God. See, in the Old Testament, there was an old circumcision that was an outward form of some kind of religion. But in the New Covenant, there's a circumcision that's deep. There's a circumcision that's in the heart. The hands of a surgeon is the Holy Spirit doing a work on the inside of our heart and our lives. Father, have your way. Let's yes. close this service out worshiping the Lord again. <coughs>